Tonight on Dispatches, as students face a hike in tuition fees, we investigate the real education gravy train. I've been lobbied often by Vice-Chancellors in, in favour of increased fees. I've never once been lobbied by a Vice-Chancellor who is concerned about the welfare or indebtedness of their students. a couple of years ago, I had debts of £9,000. But for future students, that's just a drop in the ocean. Next year's intake face fees of up to £9,000 every year. But life isn't tough for everyone. For some university bosses, the gravy train just keeps on rolling, all in the dash for cash. I've been investigating a story about money in universities that no one seems to want to talk about. My journey has taken me from British campuses Quarter of a million, vice chancellor. Yeah, yeah. That's shocking. To the search for high paying overseas students in India. International students are certainly being used as cash cows and they are being used to prop up the system. And in the increasing search for students and money, British universities are now going global. We started our investigation with the people who run universities, vice chancellors and rectors. We investigated over a hundred of them and have a comprehensive breakdown of what they get. University bosses like this man, York's Professor Brian Cantor. The university is facing a cut of 1.48 million from its state funding, but it doesn't look like he's feeling the pinch. Last year, his earnings were almost £255,000. But it's his expenses that have created a stir on campus. This information isn't publicly available. So it is quite interesting, and, and, and when, I, when we published them, um, when York Vision, uh, the student newspaper that I'm editor of, uh, published these uh, last year, um, the figures for 2006-2009 for total expenses was £135,000. Over three years, those expenses included trips to Hong Kong, China, the United States, South Korea, Japan, India and New Zealand. Meanwhile, in the past academic year, Professor Cantor has claimed over £10,000 for journeys in a chauffeur-driven car. One journey was between the Vice-Chancellor's house and the University's Heslington East Campus. It's less than two miles and costs £70. Another was a return trip from York to Heathrow Airport. Cost £634.50. But do his students have any idea about his earnings? Something like 80,000. A bit more. 120,000. It's quite a lot. <laughs> That's a bit ridiculous, to be honest. <laughs> Quarter of a million, Vice Chancellor. Yeah, Quarter of a million. <laughs> That's shocking. How do Professor Cantor's students feel about his expenses? Expenses? That's a lot as well. Um, I, would, I would have thought that that would have been too much considering everything else that he gets. York University told us that Professor Cantor often uses his own car and doesn't claim for it, takes the train where appropriate, and is often accompanied by other members of staff. Unlike other vice-chancellors, he isn't provided with his own car. The university says all his expenses were business ones, considered vital to the university's continued success. But Professor Cantor's lifestyle doesn't just include pay of over a quarter of a million pounds and use of a chauffeur-driven car. I've discovered the house he lives in is actually rent-free a perk of the job, and he stays there when on campus. York University told us Professor Cantor is required by his contract to live in the house on campus, and it's used extensively for entertaining visitors and guests. The Chancellor also stays there. We'll get back to Professor Cantor later in the programme, but he's not alone in enjoying such a generous perk of the job. While some students pay through the nose for their housing, Across the country, some university bosses live in accommodation that you, the taxpayer, pay for. Imperial's rector, Sir Keith Nyans, who last year shared a £367,000 salary with his predecessor, has the benefit of accommodation in this exclusive house in London's Queen's Gate. Meanwhile, Leeds Vice-Chancellor Michael Arthur has a pay packet of £312,000, plus benefits which include a flat on campus. 
Over in Sheffield, Vice-Chancellor Keith Burnett, whose earnings total £291,000, lives in this detached house. While in Bath, Vice-Chancellor Glynis Breakwell, who last year earned £342,000, lives in one of the city's most prestigious Georgian Crescents, again at our expense. The universities tell us that Vice-Chancellor's houses are part of the job and are used for entertaining. They explain they are often treated as benefits in kind and can help the university's profiles. In fact, dispatches can reveal that of 100 Vice-Chancellors surveyed, around half have grace and favour homes provided by the university. Even at a conservative estimate, that makes a property portfolio worth over £50 million. But does running a university really merit such generous accommodation, in addition to six-figure salaries funded by the taxpayer? Professor Steve Smith from Exeter University, one of the first to announce a tuition fee hike to £9,000 from 2012, is head of the Vice-Chancellor's umbrella organisation, Universities UK. I have a grace and favour house, as it's called. It's interesting, it's not a spare home, it's the condition of my contract that I live there, that is the family home, and that we entertain. So, we will use it regularly for university functions, um, and I pay the running costs of the bit I live in of the house. And I think it sounds great, and of course I live in a house that I couldn't afford to live in, even on the salary I'm on, but it's a working house, and it's a house whereby we are then required to do so many nights a month entertaining. But of course, you know, who's, who can look at a house and say, I'd like to live there? Well, of course they would. But the difficulty is you really have to sing for your supper. And this is where Professor Smith sings for his supper. Last year, his earnings were £314,000, plus a performance-related bonus of £27,000. Of the 100 vice-chancellors we studied, all had salaries greater than the Prime Minister, and we can reveal the top five earners. At number five, it's Malcolm Grant from UCL. Last year, he earned over £365,000. At four, it's London's Imperial College and Rector Sir Keith Anions. Last year, he and his predecessor shared £367,000. At three, it's Sir Howard Newby from Liverpool University on £372,000. In second place, Professor David Eastwood from Birmingham University on £392,000. And topping the list is Professor Andrew Hamilton from Oxford University. His annual earnings work out at £422,400. We're going through a very, very difficult time in higher education. The budget is being slashed by the, by the government. Um, jobs are being lost. It's, it's painful. And Vice-Chancellors, I think, probably didn't twig that, you know, how strong feeling was and they reflect very badly on uh, or, or appear to reflect badly on them at a time when they were you know having to then make tough decisions about other people's work. I think you need to look at the data very carefully. The latest data I've got shows that half of vice chancellors took no pay rise last year. In my own institution the pay packet of the senior team has gone down over three years not up. Um, in most universities vice chancellors have actually written to or said they don't want a pay rise. Although several vice-chancellors say they haven't had a pay rise this year, the latest published accounts for the year 2009-10, used as the basis of our investigation, reveal that most had a pay increase that year. Within the Russell Group, made up of the top 20 research universities, 80% took a pay rise. Today, the average earnings of a vice-chancellor are around £254,000. Academics, meanwhile, earn around £47,000. At a time where I am saying publicly the university system is under pressure, the cuts that are being put in place are ones that will impact on quality, does it help to hear that there are double figure pay rises, bonuses, um, extra payouts into pension pots for some? No, it doesn't and I think they really do need to think about that. I've discovered that some vice-chancellors even enjoy substantial payments when they finish their time with their universities. But payoffs, bulging pay packets, pensions, chauffeur-driven cars and grace and favour homes are not enough for some vice-chancellors. You'd imagine, at a time when university bosses are up against it, facing the biggest funding crisis in their history, that theirs would be a full-time job. But I've discovered that some vice-chancellors have time for a second job, some for a third job and some for even more. This is Nancy Rothwell, vice-chancellor of Manchester University. 
I've discovered that the university isn't her only job. She's also a director of drugs company AstraZeneca, which pays her £92,000 a year. But how much time does that directorship take up? At a time when Manchester is facing a cut in funding of 4.82 million, does she really have time for the second job? In Manchester, she also has a grace and favour home. So that's two jobs and a home. Manchester's Board of Governors told us Nancy Rothwell already held her directorship with AstraZeneca when she applied for the Vice-Chancellor's job and that it enhances her ability to carry out her role. And if people are getting paid decent salaries, they should be concentrating on doing that job. I mean, it's the same argument here in Westminster where people claim that they can be better MPs by spending half the day in, a, uh, in the offices in a central London bank or working in the, in, in the law courts. Well, that's absolute rubbish. Uh, the reality is that if you're paid to do a job, you should be doing it. Dame Nancy Rothwell isn't alone. Other Vice-Chancellors have second jobs too. The Vice-Chancellor of Leeds, Michael Arthur, takes extra money from the publicly funded Medical Research Council and is on the academic advisory board of commercial outfit Hot Houses, for which he gets paid a retainer. This on top of his £319,000 salary. We asked Leeds University how much he gets paid as a retainer, but got nowhere. Leeds University said the Hot Houses commitment is minimal. They said the Vice-Chancellor hasn't taken a pay rise in the last two years. Meanwhile, the Vice-Chancellor at Queen's Belfast, Peter Gregson, takes home over £252,000, but still manages to squeeze in a £55,000 directorship with Rolls-Royce. Queen's say Peter Gregson is expected to play a full leadership role within the University, Northern Ireland and on the national and international stage, and that this was reflected in his approved external appointment. And Richard Barnett at the University of Ulster is paid £251,000 and has an £11,500 non-executive directorship at Bombardier Shorts Aerospace. The University of Ulster says its council approved the role as it considers it enhances the university's profile and influence in Northern Ireland business. And what's more, the body that oversees university pensions, the university's superannuation scheme, includes on its board two top-earning university bosses. Professor Glynis Breakwell from Bath and Professor David Eastwood from Birmingham are paid extra to help set their own pensions. Bath University told us Professor Breakwell's external appointments are agreed with the chair of the University Council. Birmingham University told us that it benefits from Professor Eastwood's profile and influence in the university sector and his role on USS is part of that. Just like for MPs, second jobs are a nice extra earner for many Vice-Chancellors. Here in Greenwich, the Vice-Chancellor is Baroness Tessa Blackstone. She's a very busy lady. She sits in the House of Lords, where she voted 55% of the time. She's chair of the British Library. And she's also the chair of the Great Ormond Street Hospital Trust. That's four public positions, all paid for by the taxpayer. For the time she has left to run Greenwich University, she's paid over £206,000 plus nearly £29,000 in pension contributions. Greenwich University told us Baroness Blackstone attends the Lords principally in the evenings, but didn't give further details when asked. It says she is an outstanding leader and that her external engagements benefit the University, as her contacts and interests are strengths she brings to the job. But at a time when students are being asked to pay more than ever before for their university education, Shouldn't the government send a clear message to Vice-Chancellors that their high pay, perks and extra jobs are just plain wrong? I went to meet University's Minister David Willits to find out. So many University Vice-Chancellors have second jobs or third jobs or even in the case of uh, the Vice-Chancellor of Greenwich, fourth jobs. How can that be justified in terms of the work that Vice-Chancellors do? And we're taking this as um, a symbol of what's going on in universities well, as a whole. I don't know uh, exactly what the uh, judgments are of the individual vice chancellors make. I can imagine that just as in other walks of life, sometimes it is worthwhile if you have some um, extra responsibility that broadens your experience, that's relevant for what the university does, that strengthens links abroad. But again, I can't, it's actually quite important that I don't sit here trying to judge exactly what a vice chancellor's salary should be or exactly what they're allowed to do externally, because <laughs> then we'll be on a route 
to a different kind of university system. And the point is, I don't think that would be in the best interest of students. What I try to focus on remorselessly is quite simply what is in the best interest of students rather than exactly how universities run their own affairs. And even this isn't the end to the perks some vice-chancellors enjoy. Professor David Eastwood from Birmingham gets the use of a gardener and a housekeeper. Meanwhile, some vice-chancellors have their membership of private clubs, paid for by the public purse. Professor Chris Jenks from Brunel University, just outside London, is a member of not one, but two clubs, the Chelsea Arts Club and the Athenaeum, here in Pall Mall. Brunel University told us no free accommodation is provided to the Vice-Chancellor, but the University pays his subscription to the clubs so they can be used for official entertaining purposes. But it's Brian Cantor from York University who really takes the biscuit. His university is helping him run his own private chalet rental service. I've asked a friend, Anna Tully, to join me on a weekend break in France to live it up like a vice-chancellor. We've brought you here to this chalet in the French Alps, but the thing is, this isn't just any chalet. This belongs to Brian Cantor from York University. It's incredible, isn't it? Right, shall we see what it's like yeah. inside? So this is where we're going to be staying. Do you want to have a look around? See you next week. Probably bigger than my bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I want to live here. The chalet at the foot of Mont Blanc sleeps ten with four bedrooms, two kitchens, two bathrooms and a lounge. Well, this is obviously a lot bigger yeah. than most students' houses. And Professor Cantor is charging over £1,100 for the week. But at the start of our trip, we're feeling the cold. There was a problem with the heating. After difficulties with the agent, we called a number that was listed on the booking website. It belongs to the University of York. I mean, one of the issues we were having was uh, the heating the, uh, in, in the place. I mean, it's, it's kind of difficult to find out about. So, I mean, if you could give us Brian's number where well, we could get him today. Yeah, if you could ask him to give us a ring, that'd be wonderful. Well, thank you very much for your time. Bye-bye. Um, so she's just been speaking to me on York University time. His in, private secretary yeah. at York hiring out his chalet That's for him. That's absolutely outrageous. How can the university even allow that? How can he merge his private life with what he should be doing in university time? There was a good ten minutes I spent on the phone mm. there. We asked Professor Cantor why he was using his secretary at York University to deal with his private business. York University told dispatchers Professor Cantor didn't know his agent had put the university number on the website. It added he thinks it is entirely appropriate and unexceptional to use the university office as the contact point for emergencies. One of the justifications given for the pay, benefits and privileges extended to some vice-chancellors is that they are no longer just academics, but CEOs of multi-million pound institutions. Most vice-chancellors tend to be people who work I mean, the workload is, is pretty heavy, but we're very well remunerated for that. That's not the point. But a vice-chancellor has the job of running his or her own university and then being involved in the national lobbying and networking and, and groups working to improve the experience for students. So it's really a chief executive job. You've had vice-chancellors who have made appalling decisions because of a management structure which is autocratic uh, and a position where it's not even autocratic from a position of effectiveness. It's autocratic from a point of view of uh, almost just archaic, where somebody becomes vice-chancellor, they're in there for seven years or whatever their term is. They're unimpeachable, really, during that period of time. One of the difficulties behind many of our universities is that we're promoting brilliant academics to positions of management expertise and they don't have the management expertise. Next, I'll be showing you how a surprising number of British universities are expanding abroad in a never-ending search for students and money. Leeds Metropolitan University comes to your doorstep. To be a super graduate, call now. I'm writer Laurie Penny and I'm investigating the university gravy train, how some vice-chancellors are cleaning up on campus. I've discovered that one way university vice-chancellors can demonstrate that they're worth their massive paychecks is by recruiting new students. Pete here is British, and for the past five years, fees for students like him have been capped at £3,000 a year. Carly is from outside the EU, and universities from the UK can charge students like her whatever they like. 
it's hardly surprising then that there's been a massive push to recruit lucrative students from overseas. Britain is the second biggest player in the global student market, behind the United States. Students from outside the EU currently make up over 11% of all higher education enrolments here. They make up over 27% of postgraduate students, and it's estimated that they contribute more than £5 billion to the UK economy. One of the top countries sending students to British universities is India. Last year, it sent over 38,000 here, up 13% on the previous year. So the market is huge for UK universities desperate to boost finances. They cost um, £10,500. So um, right there, so very centrally located in London Bridge. At the sharp end are the recruitment bosses, who travel round the world to attend fairs organised by the British Council. This month, the push is in India. They've already been to Hyderabad, Bangalore and Chennai. Today, they're in the city of Pune. So why do I think you should come to the UK? We have a very long-standing tradition and history of providing education at postgraduate level. Okay? But be Susan O'Neill from Glasgow's Caledonian University is briefing students on life in Britain. And we have a very large Scottish Indian community in Glasgow. We have third, probably fourth generation of Scottish Indians. So students are usually quite surprised if I say you can get Alfonso mangoes when they're in season in our city. You know, international students do represent a large income stream for universities in the UK. And coming somewhere like the British Council Fairs gives the university great exposure. So it's a good way for us to do some of our international marketing. It's a way for us to connect with students, to meet interested students, and to do some marketing activity in India, yes. So why are some universities hitting the mark with some students here? I'm interested in Manchester University because uh, myself, I'm a big fan of Manchester United. That's why. And there is uh, many opportunities in that uh, course by doing at that university. That's why I'm interested. I'm interested in this Northumbria University because it also provides scholarship up to 60%. And they have better courses like microelectronics and that. But this push to recruit overseas students is not without its critics. Even the British Council has warned universities not to treat overseas students, who pay up to £26,000 every year, as cash cows. Intensifying student recruitment really serves nobody because it will actually in the long term detract from the reputation that the UK has got for its teaching, for the quality in its research and it will actually halt in, in terms of the added benefits that working in collaboration brings to a university. Staff from some universities participate in an unofficial forum on the internet. This is the email correspondence of the British University's International Liaison Association. In this exchange, members discuss abandoning links with the British Council after its criticism of overseas students being used as cash cows. Can the sector be strategic enough to follow a path of long-term, mutually beneficial outcomes in its overseas activity? Or will we be ever more driven by fee income imperatives and perhaps start seeking more commercially driven partners than the Council in order to grow market share overseas? Many universities, I'm sorry to say, just simply look at international students as a line on the profit and loss account. They don't really value fully the academic contribution to that, that they make to an academic environment, which is a university. Here in India, we've discovered further evidence of the commercialisation of British universities. The recruitment fair isn't the whole story. Behind the scenes is a small army of agents being used by universities to help them recruit students. Ajay Sukwani runs Edwise International and places thousands of students in universities outside India each year. Well, Indian students going overseas to study has always been something that is sought after. Everybody likes to go overseas to study. The business of recruiting students from India to go overseas also is about, I would say, 10 years old. And generally, the commissions to British universities would be about 10% of the total tuition fees that the international student pays, which is a bit different from other, other students that are paying fees in, in the UK. Yeah. Dispatches estimates Indian agents earn around £50 million placing students in British universities. Mr Sukwani is on an approved list of agents introduced by the UK Borders Agency. 
They were concerned after it was discovered that some agents were operating visa scams to help get immigrants into Britain. Last year, the British Council acknowledged that there are still widespread concerns about the use of agents in India. Some are accused of taking on unqualified students and promising success in admissions tests just to secure a commission. Others are accused of making false promises to students about what they can expect when they get to the UK, promising luxury accommodation, one-to-one -one tuition or guaranteed work placements. Back on the unofficial message boards used by university recruiters, it seems commission-hungry agents are a big concern. There's talk of agents offering free flights and laptops just to get students to sign on the dotted line. But how much truth is there in these stories? This is Vishnu. He's an investigative journalist based in India. He's posing as a student who wants to come to Britain. We've asked him to hit the phones and find out just how desperate agents are for his business. Uh, all the application stuff. I mean, is there anything you know special that you guys can do? I mean, which the other guys don't offer me. You know what I mean? But apart from the standard stuff, you know, you don't have anything you know exciting to offer. I mean, you know, uh, that's the, that's the whole point. I mean, you know, what are what are the things that you can offer? Finally, one agent says he can offer something the other agents can't. One way ticket to UK. Acha. But you can, uh, I mean, you know, you can offer me like a one-way ticket. Right, right. The agent isn't doing anything illegal, but this shows what deals are available in a competitive market. There are set English tests for students coming to Britain, but some agents are so desperate for the commission, they're sending students here whose English just isn't up to scratch. We know that there are some students who are coming over who don't necessarily have the language skills that we think they need. And I would argue, make sure that they have been rigorously tested ahead of time so that you can pick up on those issues and save them money and disappointment if they're not up to standard. Certainly in their reliance to recruit international students, there has been some lapses in the quality of language that have, uh, for some students that have come through. And that has created from time to time some tensions for home students who feel that they're being slowed down uh, in order to facilitate uh, more specific support required for international students. Back in Mumbai, Vishnu is now posing as a student who only speaks Hindi. Yes, my name is Shiv. और मैं UK universities के details चाहता था मैं। It doesn't take long before he finds an agent who claims she can get him into a British university. She invites him to meet a recruiter from Chester, but warns him not to let on he can't speak English. She tells him he can do a crash course later. The leading lady there, she had you know told me in no uncertain terms that. The fact that I do not know English from the university guys. In 2010, the UK Borders Agency introduced new tests allowing them to gauge the English of foreign students entering the country. On the unofficial message boards used by some university recruiters to swap information, one is angry about a Nigerian student stopped at the airport for poor English. One wonders what possessed the UK BA to behave in such a manner. Has anyone else had a similar experience? So does all this mean that standards are being compromised in British universities? I believe in high standards in universities. High standards for British students and also high standards for students from overseas. And it would be a great damage for our universities if people thought we were willing to compromise on those standards and we shouldn't. And if it's the system is being abused, I mean obviously something that we've been working on very closely with the Home Office. We want to stamp out abuse and that includes uh, abuse if agents are behaving badly. But it's not just the system that's being abused. Foreign students themselves are sometimes suffering. Figures we have obtained show that 14% drop out, and unlike domestic students, who are monitored and hit universities in the pocket if they leave, with foreign students, universities can hang on to the cash. But it's not all about bringing overseas students to study in Britain. These days, more and more British universities are exporting themselves abroad. Some are forming partnerships with foreign institutions, others are going further by opening campuses overseas. So for example, in China and Malaysia you can study at the University of Nottingham, or if you prefer, you can go to the United Arab Emirates to study at the University of Bolton. 
the University of Bolton, situated in the heart of the northwest. According to the latest Guardian University League table, Bolton is ranked 116 out of 118 universities listed. But that hasn't stopped what was once the local Institute of Higher Education from expanding overseas. The National Branch Campus, located in the booming Middle Eastern Emirate of Ras Al Khaimah. Last year, it hit the headlines when students turned down for places at its British campus were offered places at its campus in the Middle East. The most recent figures suggest that there are 13 international branch campuses belonging to British universities around the world. One of the most active universities overseas is Middlesex. It has a campus in Dubai and in Mauritius. But while Middlesex expands abroad, it's near the bottom of the university league tables. The university say it's nonsense to judge them by these unofficial rankings and say it was given a Queen's Award for Enterprise for the UK economy for providing higher education overseas. The university's last four years annual accounts reveal that its Vice-Chancellor Michael Driscoll has seen his pay rise from £187,000 to £259,000 a year and he also has free accommodation. The university says the Vice-Chancellor recommended to the university's remuneration committee that neither he nor the executive team should receive a pay rise in 2010 and think it likely he will make the same recommendation this year. His pay is in the lower quartile of comparative roles. Middlesex is now planning a third foreign campus in India, alongside 50 other foreign universities planning franchises there, all in the drive for cash. 23 million students in India they want it to be by 2020, they want to have 70 million. You're not going to get that by simply those students travelling abroad, nor can they grow, they'd have to grow 800 universities to teach that. So institutions are attracted by the thought that they can actually set out outposts. Leeds Met India Bhopal offers an internationally recognised degree. Degree costs reduced by 70% with a full-time degree course. Two and a half years in India, one semester in UK. Best international faculty and academic director from UK. Leeds Metropolitan University comes to your doorstep. To be a super graduate, call now. This is an expansion of the UK's education market, if you like, um, into overseas areas. An expansion of the, expansion of the UK education experience because they're nearly always taught by staff who are UK-based staff who go out there to teach. The increasing commercialisation of British universities is looked on by some as a great success. But with dropout rates rising and problems with unlicensed agents, there are reasons to be worried. But all this throws up another question. Is the quality of higher education in Britain being compromised because of this push to bring in money from overseas? University of Bolton, situated in the heart of the northwest. I've been investigating how the men and women at the top of British universities have been trying to boost income by opening campuses overseas. The funding for foreign campuses isn't always easy to pin down, but we do know that the University of Bolton put about £1.5 million from the UK into their foreign operation. Meanwhile, the campus itself uses a flying faculty model, whereby Bolton staff rotate between the UK and two or three month stints in the United Arab Emirates. We don't know what impact rotating staff have, nor do we know the ramifications of the way some recruiters and agents aggressively market to foreign students. But what does all this mean for higher education as a whole? Geoffrey Alderman is the former head of standards at the University of London. I think undoubtedly over British higher education as a whole there has been a dumbing down of standards partly as a result of the league table culture, partly as a result of the need for universities to subsidise their British students by taking international students uh, at, at fees where uh, virtually the sky is the limit, and partly because uh, the higher managements of universities in the Vice-Chancellor's offices don't see themselves so much as academic leaders, but as managers of taxpayers' money. So, how do the managers of universities see overseas students? They're cash cows, aren't they? Of course, not every university sees students in that way. But how do we work out which universities do and don't? Students like these here today are being treated more and more like customers. And when customers are unhappy, they complain. And that's exactly what's happening here. 
If universities aren't able to resolve complaints themselves, they're referred to the Office of the Independent Adjudicator. He is an independent super regulator, and in recent years, he has seen a sharp rise in the number of complaints from students, especially foreign students. Students should act as consumers as far as getting what is set out in the prospectus. But higher education is not a marketplace. Students do not buy their degrees, and there has to be absolute clarity that you don't go to university and can then decide what sort of degree you should get. That is an academic judgment. In one Times Higher Education survey of academics, 77% of those who responded said they felt coerced into awarding inflated marks. 69% felt the increase in first-class degrees was not a sign of improving standards. And 52% said the reports of universities dumbing down were not overstated. Dr Paul Buckland has been an academic for more than 30 years. He has published over 100 papers. For four years, he taught environmental archaeology at Bournemouth University until he felt forced to resign. Well, the problem began with students doing resits of an examination which they'd failed the previous May June. So this was their second attempt to pass. The papers came in, I looked at them, and several of them did pass. But the majority simply had done nothing over the summer, they'd done no revision. And inevitably, I failed them. It went to the examination board, the examination board agreed, yes, this is a fail. But at that point, the management issue kicks in. And the chair of the examination board decided to get somebody else to mark because there were so many fails. These students were given a pass on that course. And my reputation as a teacher, examiner, researcher, effectively, my integrity as a university lecturer was wiped out by that action. It was actually said to me, well, we're talking about £3,000 per student here. And if they fail, they're not going to get those fees for the following year. Last year, Dr Buckland won a claim for constructive dismissal. He hasn't been able to find full-time work since he left Bournemouth in 2007. Bournemouth University told us it is committed to the quality of its academic programmes. It added that the case brought by Professor Paul Buckland was primarily concerned with matters of employment law and not matters of academic quality. Dr Buckland's case was four years ago. Since then, few other academics have spoken out publicly. But dispatches asked for comments from university staff about this very issue. Among the many comments we received were... Students are accepted on their ability to pay rather than academic qualifications. Another said... The system is corrupt to the core. I doubt you'd get many prepared to say this on camera. A third complained... A climate of fear existed, so that lecturers felt as if they could not raise academic issues like this without fear of being rebuked and made to feel out of order. At times, I felt that the benchmarks could not be lowered any further. But no one would speak out on camera. For many, campuses were a cowed world, especially as one bad comment could damage the whole business plan. With a lack of open discussion on campus, and concern growing about academic standards, the question of how much foreign students pay takes on a whole new light. Universities can charge whatever they like for overseas students. We did a story um, last summer where I think the highest uh, fee paid for a single year was £26,000. So it's a massive amount of money, and it matters to universities. You know, whatever they tell you, it does. There are other competing interests. Governments want to limit visas to overseas students, but for some universities, rich overseas students who could pay over the top were becoming a valuable commodity at universities as they sought to balance the books. At the London School of Economics, two-thirds of students are from overseas, many able to pay top rates. Eight years ago, one of those overseas students was the son of Libyan leader Colonel Gaddafi. Saif Gaddafi was awarded a PhD in 2008. A year later, the Gaddafi Foundation donated £1.5 million to the university. I think it does illustrate what happens when a university, in some sense, betrays its core values and goes after money. Uh, but in this case, they went after the wrong money. I don't want to be rude to LSE, -E, but you have to go to an LSE -E seminar, which I sometimes do, and you'll be surprised how many students there don't speak English. Um, I mean, some of these places are finishing schools, and they're for the rich of the world. 
Um, and th they are no longer, I think, applying what I call rigorous admission standards because they're effectively selling a university degree to the highest bidder. Do you have any evidence about that? I have no evidence of that at On all. On selling a university degree? Well, you're, you're selling a university degree, that's what they're doing. They sold a university degree to Gaddafi's son for a million pounds. I mean, these are the, these are the problems you get into if you have unlimited uh, fee structures for one group of students, but very restrictive fee structures for other students. LSE Director Sir Howard Davies, on a salary of 285000 resigned after the donation came to light. The LSE has launched an independent inquiry to see if there was anything improper about the donation and the PhD awarded to Saif Gaddafi. It is also committed to establishing appropriate guidelines for future donations. Papers Dispatches has obtained reveal that not only was Gaddafi's son awarded a degree a year before the Gaddafi International Charity and Development Foundation agreed to hand over the cash, but the LSE consulted American financier George Soros, who recommended its acceptance. Soros, also a former LSE pupil, now admits his judgment was a mistake. Do you think it's right for universities to take money from these kind of sources? You know, for universities to seek students and seek those connections purely to bring in money? Uh, it shouldn't be done purely to bring in money. It should be as people who also have to have the academic standards to benefit from British higher education. But let's be clear, I think it is in the interests of British students if their experience of going to university is one where they have the opportunity of meeting students from abroad. Would you have wanted to go to university and only meet British citizens? The fact that there should be I think having a mix of students from around the world actually enriches the student experience for people from Britain. And secondly, it is in Britain's national interest that we have people who go on to the uh, perhaps, dictators. <laughs> no, 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 serious business people, inventors uh, and uh, uh, leaders and politicians elsewhere who look back and have a link to this country because of the experience of going to higher education. My journey following the cash hadn't quite reached an end. Back to the unofficial emails between university recruiting staff. Dispatches found telling correspondence about commission payments to foreign agents. I realise that this bit is rather sensitive and we'll understand if people don't want to respond, but we were wondering whether you'd be willing to share information about the amount of commission slash discount you pay to the agents. One asked, Do you pay a commission? If yes, and if you're happy to share? Another said, I recognise that this is commercially sensitive, but would you mind letting me know if your institution offers your agents commission for courses that follow on from International Foundation Diploma or Pre-Masters Diploma when they are taught in-house? Five years ago, British public schools were charged and fined for colluding in fee-fixing, the Office of Fair Trading ruling that the regular and systematic exchange of confidential information was anti-competitive and resulted in higher fees than would otherwise have been the case. Could it be that these informal communications between university staff would raise concerns for the OFT that there was anti-competitive behaviour tainting the recruitment of overseas students? Another potential problem for the men and women at the top of our universities. I mean, as a Liberal Democrat who voted against the rise in tuition fees uh, last year, uh, obviously I have my concerns about what the government did, but I have to say I'm even more annoyed uh, with the Vice-Chancellors as a cadre, not every last one of them, but as a group, who lobbied for the increase in tuition fees uh, and pushed the government to do just that. But then when it came down to it, the government took the flag, and the Vice-Chancellors were by and large hiding behind a bunker and pretending that they had nothing to do with it. And I know several Vice-Chancellors who, when met by their students' union vice president was saying yes isn't it terrible what the government's doing to you when the vice chancellors themselves had lobbied for exactly what the government had done but of course vice chancellors aren't to blame for everything they don't set their own salaries they're set by other people and governments have contributed to the commercialization of universities by their policies and the way they fund universities But I'd like our universities to be seats of learning, rather than places where students are seen as customers. I want foreign students to be respected for what they bring to academia, and that's not just money. If we want to stop commercialisation destroying education, we have to take a stand.